right, so lecture 22 is upon us. I think we only have um, six more lectures after the day. I mean, this is, this is chapter 11. Uh, the, the book goes through chapter 14. Let's just, let's just take a look at the rest of the schedule out here. So here's my calendar. This is week 11. Um, week 12, next week we'll get a chapter energy, which is costing energy. So just looking at the, the prices, cost of energy. Um, week 13, this is um, Thanksgiving week. Week 13, and we'll cover penalties as best we can. We'll be here on Tuesday the 24th. And then um, the next week is week 15. We will cover uh, remedies. Okay, so there actually are, um, there actually are 15 weeks. So we've got... Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll spread the last couple chapters out over those last three weeks, basically, since there's only, um, uh, so it looks like we actually will have 30 lectures this uh, semester. We'll go all the way to December 10th, and then, yeah, here's finals. So, I think there's a... Um, Looks like the NRGY 101 lecture. No, I'll have to get you the I'll have to get you the um, final time for uh, the 101 final if you want to take it face to face. You don't have to, but. Um, So finals week is, is there. So we, we, we basically have um, uh, three, three chapters left. Uh, since it's week 11, we have week 12, which is full. Week 13 is a half. And then 14 and 15 are both full weeks. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lectures after today. 29, I guess 29 lectures. Today. Okay. So let's go ahead. Um, Can you go to the... Uh meeting next week for the solar energy and main campus. It's, uh, I can't remember what, what they call it. But they're having a meeting for a lot of the environmental people because they're considering using their grant to put in three megawatt solar energy system. Using what grant? I don't know. Oh, yeah. It was our uh, um, politics professor was talking about the meeting for next week. Hmm. Robin Saha? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's good that's still on the table. You know, because uh, I know the I know the ASUM voted in favor of putting the, the three megawatt array on campus. For some reason, I'm, I'm still very uh, fuzzy about, you know, President Ingstrom actually said he was not interested in pursuing it. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm really not sure why, because, I mean, the way it was proposed to the administration by um, Brian Kearns. So, you know, Brian Kearns is uh, our energy efficiency engineer on campus, uh, said that he would do the legwork and the groundwork to find the, the funding to put the thing in. That, like, the university was not going to have to um, necessarily put up any of its own dollars. And now there was, there was a, an, and I think I might even have the letter here. I can I can show it to you. No, fifteen people are heading to administrators are heading to China at least five thousand dollars a piece. Travel. Oh, for, to what end? To promote the university. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it would be great to see a more diverse student body here, and, and um, I, I, I hope that the university does have something to offer Asian students. Um, I, I've seen a few on campus, but not, not nearly as many as you see at other campuses around the country. But, yeah, I, I'm assuming, Tynan, you're talking about this $30 million. And, and again, I'm not sure why the, why the price tag got so high. You know, $10 a watt seems pretty high in today's environment. Uh, maybe it's just because there's some, some kind of tight infrastructure back there. But this was Royce's uh, response to the ASUM. Solar project. Uh, folks, we're going to solar Oh, the upper limit contribution for electricians might be as high as 10%. Uh, that, you know, that seems, um, that seems pretty low to me. I mean, I, I can't imagine it's that low. We can do the math really quick. Um, let's, just, let's just do the math. You know, I, I've done this calculation several times before. We can just do it again. So, um, and we'll, we'll just do we'll do worst case scenario first. So, let's just assume everything is electric, and that every single person on campus gets all of their electricity from from the solar array. Like no one gets their electricity from home. Um, no one burns any gas. It's just all electric. So first of all, so we know that um, so three. Uh, times 10 to the sixth watts and there are 15 times 10 to the third people uh, what's that what's that come out to so we got um, so one-fifth times uh, 1,000 equals uh, 200 watts. It's 200 watts per person. Um, what we didn't account for is the fact that the, a 3 megawatt array uh, has a, has a um, co uh, operation of coefficient of about one-sixth. So in a 24-hour in a day, on average, Missoula receives four and a half hours of sunlight. So we got to take that and divide it by uh, divide that by six. And that comes out to um, 33 watts per person. So that's not a heck of a lot when it comes right down to it. But um, and let's let's see what what fraction of a of a single person's power consumption is. So if we go back to that, um, that whole techno-slave model, each, each, each one of us, each North American is running at 100 times 120. It's unbelievable every time I look at it. Uh, one, two, zero, zero, zero. Each one of us is running at 12,000 watts of technological power on average. So now we can do our percentage. Thirty-three divided by one, two, oh, 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 of course. Yeah, about three percent. <laughs> but that, and so, so the number he threw out there is is not. Well, it's correct in the very worst case scenario. It assumes that people live on campus and get all their energy there. So you, you could you could probably you know if you say hey people probably only spend about one third of their time on campus. Second, did I do that right? Is it is it a thirty-three divided by twelve? 
Oh, it's not even 3%, it's 0.3%. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Well, again, that's, yeah, huh, it's worst case scenario. I guess, I guess to do it properly, you'd have to go and, and actually look at the university's power consumption. This is just kind of back of the envelope, but um, yeah, three megawatts does sound like a lot until you you know chop it up between fifteen thousand people. Well, well, we're talking about all the buildings and then what people are using inside of each building. That's you just take out the dorms. You don't even worry about the dorms in general and just class buildings. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, it's it just but to. Um, He does make a good point in that similar continuing investing in building upgrades and energy conservation could be better. And, and, he, and this actually is a really good point. You know, why not go in and change out all the light bulbs instead and reduce the energy per capita, uh, for example, or you know, go in and do some insulation. Yeah, but I, I guess I guess what he's saying is he does not have an extra five hundred thousand dollars laying around at the moment to do this. I mean, the, the, unfortunately, the um, and he didn't come right out and say it, but the university I guess is three million bucks in debt now because of uh, low enrollment, and, he, and it's and it's um, I, I think I mean I can't help but think, but the whole crack hour book didn't dissuade a lot of otherwise. Um, wealthy female out of state students coming from our campus. I mean I, I think this thing was in the Wall Street Journal, you know, and yeah, and, and for somebody sitting there in New York saying, Oh, I don't I don't think I'm gonna send my eighteen year old daughter out to the rape capital of the US. So I, I, I cannot help but think that, that that hurt us a little bit. So and it's blasted all the Google. Yeah. Krakauer is a pretty, pretty, um, pretty big shot. He's written, written some pretty, pretty high-end books, pretty popular books. And I don't know if this is true or not, but Peggy Kerr, when she went to the Krakauer um, uh, talk, at, it sounded like she just asked him. So you know, so John, why did you, you know, why did you pick Missoula? There's a lot of other college campuses in the country that have, you know, similar problems. He said, well, you know, I, I was thinking I might move here someday. It's kind of a neat place to live, and it was a good, you know, two, you know, two for one deal to come and do a little little book while I was house hunting. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know the whole conspiracy of great cover-ups. Well, again, I was not directly involved with any of it, and it, anything I heard was was rumor and hearsay. But um, you know, based on some of the statements coming from from our local law enforcement, we're we're not not all overly encouraging. I will I will say that a little little cavalier. All right. Well, on that note, let's um, let's go nuclear. So last time we, I think we ended up on figure uh, figure nine. We were talking about nuclear disasters. Uh, the last little paragraph here in box eleven point nine. This is before I, I do want to get into eleven seven waste disposal and decommissioning. It says at, at the time of writing. This was June twenty eleven. The full extent of the damage or the total release of radiation is still not fully clear. This is at Fukushima. Electric power has been restored to the site together with cooling to the reactors and spent fuel ponds. The leaking radioactive water from the site is being gathered in the storage tanks. The levels of radioactivity in the damaged buildings are such that workers can only stay in parts of them for a few hours before accumulating a whole year's worth of dosage. 
although the accident was initially rated as being far less serious than Chernobyl, it is now being classified as being on a similar scale. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, here's, here's one more thing before we get into waste disposal. Um, here's some statistics. I'm just going to look at page 443 here, right in the middle of, of the page. The overall probability of an accident. So, sorry, but all technologies fail. There, there, no one's invented an, an immortal technology yet. Um, what's maybe the hand axe? You guys remember the hand axes out of Africa? I mean, you can still dig those up two million years later and, and kill an animal with them. So, maybe a, a rock. <laughs> a rock is as close as we can get to an immortal human technology. But, but really though, seriously, the, the more complex a technology becomes, sort of the harder it is to fix, the quicker it dies, more things that are to break, et cetera. And there are few, few technologies on the planet much more complicated than nuclear power plants. Um, okay, but what they say is that the, uh, the overall probability of an accident that proceeds all the way to damage to the core for U.S. reactors is in, has been put to be one in about 10,000 years. So what that means is if you have um, one reactor, I'll write that out. And so here's the way to think about that. Um, you know, one accident per 10,000 years Um, if, you had, if you had one reactor, obviously, it, you might expect it to fail 10,000 years from now. If you had um, 10, you would expect one every 1,000. We have more like on the order of 100 reactors, not exactly, the numbers are in the book. So that means that um, the and this is, this is also something you might, you might want to look at if you get out there into your career. There's this whole thing known as the mean time between failure. And seriously, if you want to dig into this a little bit, it, there's, a whole, there's a whole set of studies out there. I might even have a copy of my own paper if you want to read it where I did, did some of this. Um, documents. Papers. I think this thing came out. Uh, yeah, in 2010, it was the Naval Engineers Journal. So I had a student uh, working with me there in at, um, at Drexel, and he was on the Coast Guard, and was really interested in trying to determine uh, what the optimum number of spare parts is. So obviously, you're out to sea. Some part goes bad. You can't just drive back into town and, and pick it up necessarily. So, but how many do you need? You know, what, what, what's the total number of light bulbs you need to bring on board or engine parts, what have you? So this guy, um, Gorshin, took a shot at it. And so obviously you don't want to have too many spare parts on board. It's, it's wasteful. Um, but here's the, uh, here's the mean time between failure. Um, here's the here's the time the patrol time and uh, matrix A represents the baseline historical method for stocking spare parts. Uh, so you're going to be multiple spare parts, and um, you know each one is going to have some tendency to fail, and then each one is also going to have a um, a safety factor. So. You know, for example, the chairs that we're sitting in, if, if you weighed 1,000 pounds, you'd probably crush the chair. But if you weighed 200 pounds, you're not going to crush the chair. So the safety factor on the chair is five. So same, same deal on the parts, anything that's um, you know, running for a certain number of RPMs for a certain amount of time, it's going to fail eventually. But if it's running well into the specs, it's got a, a better safety factor on it. So. We did a little bit of that. There's your safety factors, mean time between failure, and then how many spare parts you need. 
So you, you know, you could obviously do the same thing for a. Um, Nuclear power plant. Um, and so what we came up with is here's sort of the optimum number of parts given a certain probability of failure. So anyway, there's a little bit of a little bit of science out there on this stuff. This thing's and this thing's gotten cited a bunch of times. It's, it's uh, kind of interesting to see after you write something who reads it. Okay. Now, let's assume your, your power plant did not fail and your waste has been consumed and now it has to go somewhere. So 11.7 um, tells us that a one gigawatt coal-fired power plant is going to make 3.5 million tons. It's going to consume 3.5 million tons and produce 1.5 million tons of waste. That's a lot. That's more than I would have thought. It seems like a lot more. I mean, it, 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 wow. It's some pretty wimpy coal. <laughs> there would be a lot more just carbon in there. Uh, anyway, okay, so 1.5 out of 3.5 tons of waste in the form of ash. If you've been listening to the news, you probably heard about um, Duke Energy's issue with their ash piles. Yeah, um, although what you can see here is that a lot of it gets turned into um, concrete, so it's uh, reasonably good building material. However, it says the volumes of fuel and waste for a one gigawatt nuclear, so they're comparing apples and apples here, you know, one gigawatt power plant, they're more modest, you know, so there's less of it, but it's, it's sort of more toxic. You're not going to turn your uranium your plutonium into concrete and walk around on it. So um, these are the excluded from the human environment, in some cases extremely long time. The radioactive parts of the power plant at the end of the life are significant. And also the, um, it's not just the fuel, but the, all of the, the metals, like the entire plant itself is now um, radioactive and toxic. Send it into space. Send it into space. Love it. Well, we're you here for our, our Enrico Fermi conversation, like actually using using nuclear weapons to send nuclear waste into space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that, that has been thought of. Yeah, that has been considered. Uh, <laughs> well, it's it, it's just curious to me that it, that it doesn't just go back into the mine. You know, the the mine is already. Uh, yeah. So. And isn't it more unstable after it's been used? Um, if there's plutonium in it, yes, it can be more unstable after it's been used. Yeah. Uh, but we we talked about a little bit last time about taking that plutonium and reusing it as fuel. Okay. So in a uranium mine, if you're doing um, uh, one ton. So, so what they're what they're showing here is basically one ton. Is going to give you um, one gigawatt year of electricity. So if we just if we just sort of start there at the top, I think we can see that here on the on the slides. Yeah, there we go. So. <clears throat> if in your ore, 20% of it is usable, th these five tons of waste uh, per is going to end up as uh, 542,000 tons of waste rock, some of which might be slightly um, radioactive. And oh, so it's it's 217 tons. So you see right here. So the 217 tons of uranium. Let me just change that. Two hundred seventeen tons. So 
basically what I'm doing. I'm just starting at the very top and skipping to the bottom. So 217 tons of uranium going in at the top is going to give you one gigawatt year of electricity. So it might sound kind of weird. What's a gigawatt year? Well, it's just it's just a lot more energy than a kilowatt hour. So a gigawatt um, is one one million times greater than a kilowatt, and a year is 365 times greater than well, 365 times 24 times greater. <laughs> than an hour, so um, a million times 365 times 24 is the, is the ratio between a kilowatt hour and a gigawatt year. So obviously we're talking about the plant scale. Um, so now we're doing some chemical conversion, uranium hexafluoride, we talked about that chemistry a little bit, there it is, UF, um, enrichment going from 0.7% all the way up to 3.6%, that's the U U-235. Um, again, waste coming off of this on a, on a daily basis, um, and by the time uh, by the time you're you're done, you end up with um, 25 tons of uranium. Uh, this is making 42 gigawatt days per ton. 30 at 34 percent efficiency. That's just your um, Carnot efficiency, and then you've got one gigawatt year. So. Losses all the way along, and here they are, sort of heading off to a storage facility like the one we see here. Um, so this is Sellafield in England. I believe in this case, it's just it's just stored on site. On site, there's already the the permitting to uh, you know do the uh, to make the power, and so it's just um, it's just there. Another interesting thing, it says that the deplete, deplete, depleted uranium tails are not classified as waste because they can be a, a fuel for future fast breeder reactors. Not too bad. Packaged and stored as uranium hexafluoride, and in 2007, the UK had 25,000 tons of this. Now, here are your wait times. It says waiting for the rate radioactivity to fall by yet a further factor of six could be 100 years. And let's just look up a few half-lives. I do ask you on the exam to give me a half-life problem. So let's just go ahead out here. And really what we're looking at, so the different uraniums are going to have different um, half-lives. Let's just kind of take them in order. That's a while. <laughs> and that, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of it. I mean, that's why, that's why, we, why we see um, so much uranium-238. And as we said before, it's got those extra electron or extra neutrons sitting there to um, make it more stable. Let's look at 235 and there are, is no shortage of isotopes. This computer's acting kind of slowly today. Yeah. Uh, okay, so 235 is is still quite long, but, but substantially shorter than 238. Let's look at a couple more isotopes. 234, I would think this would be quite, quite short. Yeah, much, much shorter, 200, 245,000 years for 234. I want to find one that's really, uh, really short, though. 236. We talked about uranium-236 a little bit last time, and the fact that it was quite unstable. Is 
What do you see? Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, huh? Yeah, way, way shorter. So 232. Well, no, this is this is 232. Look, I want to I want to find it for 236. Yeah, I think that's plutonium. Hmm. A nuisance, long-lived radioactive waste. Um, oh, okay, yeah, there we go. So we're looking at um, 23 million years. Okay, I, I didn't think it'd be quite that long. All right, so the, the, and so the, the nuisance 236 is, is kicking around for a long time. Now, there, there's, so Sellafield said the cooling tanks with some, some of them being stored in vitrification where they're in stable glass rather than a, in a gas or a powdery form. Oh, and then this is, this is one of my favorite figures in the whole book. So this is showing the, and we, we talked about, you know, last week, could be, you know, maybe spent uranium fuel passes through Missoula, Maybe not. We don't know about it. Maybe you don't want to know about it. But what these uh, engineers are showing here is that if you do crash a storage container head-on collision right at the front of a, of a uh, train, then at least this, this particular container that they've designed will survive the crash. Okay. Now, here's, um, here's a um, storage as proposed in Sweden. I don't know what it is about Sweden. I mean, they, they import garbage now to make electricity. You know, they're so efficient with the recycling that nobody really throws anything away anymore. And so, uh, since they don't have the, you know, coal oil, what have you, they, br you know, bring in garbage and, and burn that for electricity. It looks like they're even like, hey, bring you know, bring the nuclear waste. Fine, we'll we'll hoard that for you. Stick it uh, 500 meters uh, below the Earth's surface in these sort of bentonite clay-capped uh, copper canisters with it with a cast iron insert. So um, that that's your pellet of uranium dioxide. The you know the iron and the copper is there. Really, is a mechanical barrier. I don't think it's that great of a, of a radiation barrier, but just so that if um, earthquake, flood, volcano, what have you, they they stay intact. It's all of that uh, clay, basically, that's uh, providing the radioactive shielding. Okay. So after the fuel's gone, the, pl and the plant itself needs to be torn down. Uh, it's, uh, and so the, the word for that is decommissioning, meaning that you do it in a, in a safe manner. You don't just blow it up. Uh, many of its components, the reactor, the reactor pressure vessel have become radioactive. So the UK is to remove all the non-radioactive first, but leave, just leave the core right where it is, weatherproof in some sort of state you know, safe store, they call it, to cool off, and then just, just let it um, radiate, if you will, for 100 years before anybody comes back and, and touches it. All right, so that's 11.7. Let's see what 11.8 has in store for us. 